thank you for being here. Uh, I've got an exciting presentation for you. We appreciate you joining us. Uh, we've got good participation. People keep popping on every moment or so, which is great. Uh, today, as usual, we hope to give you a general overview of the key issues uh, that are impacting both the U.S. and the global economies. We're focusing on those areas that will impact most of our attendees. Thank you for registering early. Uh, please note the chat box uh, is open, so there's ample opportunity to uh, present a question uh, should anything cross your mind. We hope to uh, answer questions as we go through today. Several of you have submitted questions in advance. We appreciate those and we will address those as we go through the presentation today. So let's review a quarter of continued adjustment, recovery, uh, growth, change, and uh, as usual, a lot of uncertainty. Uh, I'm Marshall Gunn, I'm your presenter as looking back. This is uh, the start of our sixth year. Uh, so that's kind of a really neat thing uh, to me that we've had six years of quarterly economic updates and we faced all kinds of issues during that time frame, and yet uh, in the words of, words of Elton John, I guess we're still standing. So when we had our annual economic update just three months ago, the U.S. economy was beginning to slow slightly. Uh, inflation was beginning to slow. We had unemployment continuing to hover at all time lows. Uh, we were optimistic that the Fed rate adjustments will result in a soft landing uh, and so we're adjusting to a new norm. Americans continued along for many of the pre-pandemic lifestyle norms. Time with family and friends, travel, freedom, and of course that great U.S. American pastime, spending money. Uh, even if they're having to spend a lot more than they did pre-pandemic. So what does all this mean? Well, joining us today is my good friend, Casey Wilson, KC, uh, help us understand what's going on. We've got a lot happening, and uh, I look forward to, to hearing what you have to share with us. Good morning. Thank you, Marshall. So happy to be with you guys this morning. I've uh, been on the CPS trade team for the past seven years, and happy to uh, speak with you guys this morning and share a little bit about what we see going on. I want to start off on this first slide to review where we are uh, year to date. Uh, this is all through the first quarter uh, ending March 31st. And as you can see so far, it's been a good year. Uh, markets are moving in the direction we like, uh, making money, moving up and to the right. Uh, and you know, overall things have been moving fairly smoothly. Although we'll get into some of the other things that have happened. I'm sure a, a lot of cause for concern uh, and what you see on the news or various headlines, but all in all, uh, the markets are moving uh, very well. We can see that NASDAQ is up 17% as a quarter in, uh, followed up by the S&P 500 of about seven and a half, uh, then the Bloomberg Ag about three, uh, and then the Dow Jones about just under a percent. And I wanna follow up uh, this chart to dig a little bit deeper into what this looks like uh, from a, a sector perspective. And so, I want to compare the first quarter of this year to what it looks like year over year uh, to have a little bit more reflection on where we are uh, today, uh, given you know where we've come out of COVID uh, and the recovery progress and line that we're still on. Uh, you can see at the bottom uh, performance, the top performers were con communication services along with technology. And a lot of these uh, spaces, you know, were beat up pretty well last year. Uh, you can see also consumer discretion uh, up about 16% in the first quarter, uh, but year over year still down about 18%. Um, so more green this year, uh, moving those indexes uh, up and to the right. But as we reflect year over year, you know, the economy is still recovering from a performance standpoint from a lot of the pullback we saw last year. And uh, going to dive into that and kind of why that pullback happened and, and maybe why the market has began the year uh, moving quite aggressively in, in that short term period. And, you know, will that hold for the rest of the year or what we might see or expect moving forward? So you might recognize this slide 
Uh, on the left hand side is what Pat reviewed uh, for the annual update uh, in January. So a lot of the concerns of what may be that bumpy road ahead is what's going on with the Fed. The Fed still matters. Uh, are they going to stick to their statements? Uh, what market repricing adjustments going to take place? And then, you know, energy prices, the war uh, with Russia and Ukraine, tension between China and Taiwan, and other political and fiscal responsibilities. So more of the same uh, continuing to be the story, but obviously there's been a good amount of other chatter going on uh, to start the year. So what we see really at taking place uh, in Q1 and maybe being more of the narrative throughout the remainder of this year uh, still has a lot to do with the Fed. The Fed has been on the top of the news as it relates to their battle against inflation and what is that uh, fiscal response going to be. And so historically, if we take a look back, the Fed has always sided on being more aggressive. Uh, the narrative is always they always overdo it and then have to respond by cutting rates. So, you know, if we look at history, we'd expect that to be more of the same, um, but there's a lot of factors showing that, um, you know, where we, well, we have a soft landing, what's going on in the economy, uh, and what's going on with the Fed, we'll, we'll continue that conversation as we go through some of these slides. The other big news that's really driven a lot of concern throughout the market is what's going on with the banking sector. Uh, Silicon Valley Bank, uh, began to make headlines uh, probably just about a month ago, uh, and it's been all over the news and kind of what that ripple effect is going to be. And so far, a lot of the data that we've seen really points that this is unique to the business of that bank. Uh, will there be extra market effects? Absolutely, um, but maybe not to the extent uh, that the market uh, earlier predicted and kind of responses to what was going to happen. Uh, the economy is surely going to be affected by tighter lending standards. Uh, and you know, if we go back to 2008 and out of the great financial crisis, a lot of those regulations put on banks has really kept uh, of banks mostly afloat right now, given everything that's going on. So the market is going to pay the price now by having, you know, not, maybe not qualifying for that loan or having to pay higher rates. And some businesses may not be able to afford those higher rates, and so therefore is going to uh, reduce the amount of capital spending that they have to go out and grow the business or to invest capital in ways that they may believe will grow their businesses. So all that moving towards uh, slower growth moving forward. Uh, lastly, many investors still remain on the sidelines. It's interesting to note, uh, we look at a lot of fund flows and where investors are moving money uh, month over month. And a lot of money continues to be moving towards safer assets such as cash. And so really showing that there's still a lot of fear in the market, even given what we've seen in the first quarter as far as market performance, a lot of money is still sitting on the sidelines. The economy in focus, uh, we're going to go through these five points. Uh, really just going to give you a quick high level overview of what we're seeing and what this may relay and, and play out through the remainder of this year uh, and how the economy responds. First one is going to be GDP. I uh, wasn't able to update this one. We have a new GDP print uh, this morning. Uh, if we look on the bottom here, this is real GDP quarter over quarter and what those numbers are. So from Q4, uh, GDP uh, grew 2.6%, and that's an annualized number uh, in this morning we got q1 of 2023 gdp number and that number came out at 1.1 percent again that is an annualized number so what that means is the economy grew just over a quarter percent uh, through the first quarter of this year albeit slower growth but growth is still growth uh, and the economy is still you know doing what it's supposed to do if we look over here uh, this goes back 20 years looking at gdp and gdp uh, for those of you who need a refresher, it's just the value of all the goods and services produced uh, within a country. And the country of the U.S. you know, has been a machine in, in letting that growth uh, continue year after year after year, uh, becoming the economy that we are uh, in the world. And two things I really want to highlight is almost 70 percent, just less than 70 percent of GDP is based on me, you, everyone on this call going out and spending money on goods or services. And so 
you might think 70%, that's a, that's a lot that depends on you and I. Uh, but you and I are the economy where we go spend our money, um, gas, food, um, services, entertainment, all those things contribute to the growth of the economy. And so the strength of the consumers really does drive earnings of businesses, but also drive the overall growth of our economy. And so we'll take a, a look at consumers and kind of the strength of the labor market. Um, but also want to note one last point. If we look here, uh, so first quarter of 2023, we had a 1.1 annualized growth number for Q1. At the moment, the Fed is declaring or basically issuing a statement saying that they predict 2023 to have an annualized growth number of about 0.4%. And so today, if we have an annualized number at 1.1, the only way we're going to get to a 0.4% uh, year over year growth for 2023 is if we see lower growth the remainder of this year. I know recession may be on a lot of people's minds. And is it possible that we could have two quarters this year of negative GDP? Absolutely. Um, that would probably bring us closer to where the Fed sees that average moving. But at the same time, we could just have some very low or sideways growth numbers. At, the point, at this point, no one really knows what will happen. Um, but if we look at a lot of data that we'll continue to go through, it, it does point to factors of the economy that is slowing down or putting pressure on the pace of which we can grow throughout the remainder of this year. And on that topic uh, is jobs. We've seen a lot of headline news about jobs and really, Last year, we did have two negative quarters of GDP, but there was a lot of uh, debate on to whether it was a declared recession or not because of one main factor, and that was the employment market. Uh, generally, if you're in a recession, you're going to see unemployment rise significantly, but that's one piece of data we have not yet to see. And here, I really wanted to put these two charts uh, top of each other. Uh, the top we have US job openings, and then we have the unemployment rate. You can see there is a relationship between these two numbers. As you see, uh, or expect as job openings decline, meaning businesses are not having as many help wanted or issuing as many new jobs, you would expect the unemployment rate to go up. And throughout history, that has taken place except for what we've seen really over the last couple of years. We've seen job openings stay relatively high compared to history, uh, but we've actually began and slowly seen that number come down. However, the unemployment rate has not correlated the same way yet. Uh, this number, most recent number, about 3.5% unemployment, where you'd expect this number of job openings to come down, you, we would have began to expect to see that number go up. Uh, we think it may. Uh, we think it's probably going to move more in that direction as the job openings number, number comes down. But the biggest factor and really how COVID has changed the labor market is in a number of ways. It's changed a lot of the workforce, um, meaning that the workforce participation or the number of people out there looking for jobs is significantly down, uh, mostly attributed to baby booners. Uh, retiring uh, or taking early retirement or uh, a couple other factors, but we've seen that labor force uh, slow significantly. It has created a slowdown in how quickly this unemployment uh, number will go up. It's a key piece to what the Fed is looking at to see you know, how much the economy is really cooling down. Next. As it relates to the consumer, uh, the consumers are you and I who have jobs. And right now, for the most part, anyone looking for a job uh, is able to go out and get one. However, we face a lot of pressure in inflation. A lot of this came from multiple factors uh, in response to what we saw in COVID, to being the slow or the shutdown of the economy, creating significant issues or lag in inventory. Um, the other, uh, just being, as we've seen, these costs go up, um, contributing to uh, higher costs. We've seen real wage growth numbers go up, uh, and the cost of goods go up tremendously last year uh, as it relates to commodities or other metals, 
uh, in an awakening of the Russia and Ukraine crisis. And so uh, the Fed obviously talks a lot about inflation and wanting to see that number cool uh, before they can begin to reverse what they do on interest rates. Thankfully, uh, we've seen this number begin to come down and we think it's going likely to continue to come down. Uh, but where inflation goes and what the new long-term rate of inflation will be, I think we see, and maybe we're gonna see the Fed pivot here on what is the new norm. Right now, if we go out on rates where they expect to be uh, for a normalized rate for inflation is about two and a half percent. We still have a little bit to go on, on how quickly or uh, how soon we'll get there. At the moment, uh, a lot of expectations that we'll get to that range around 2025 um, from what the market's expecting and what for the Fed is expecting as well. So continue to keep an eye on it. Obviously, uh, energy prices coming down in recent uh, is helping uh, bring that number down in a tremendous way uh, that really affected last year in a, in a big, big way. Next, looking at earnings. We're in the middle of earnings season and a lot of headlines coming out. And it's really been a mixed review. Uh, some companies having great numbers, technologies having a great year uh, as they increase. And you see a lot of headlines with AI uh, and in increase their ability to automate processes and uh, create more uh, revenue through ad and, and more people um, utilizing uh, digital advertising. Uh, to bring and drive more revenue for their own businesses. But we go back and really look at quarter two of 21, where we saw a peak in profit margin, we begin to see that number trend down. But at the same time, what has happened that same time period? Inflation's been up significantly. The cost of capital through interest rates going up has also gone up significantly, all of which put a lot of pressure on the profit margins of a company. And I think it's interesting to note, if we were to, to overlay this chart with revenue, you would see uh, the inverse happen. A uh, company's revenue last year was a lot of um, record years for companies in terms of revenue, but uh, really over the last two years, there's been a tremendous amount of pressure put on profit margins. However, I do wanna note, that where we are today, about 11, uh, just over 11%, is actually pretty normal. Uh, if we go back and we look at you know, the last decade of quarters, 11%, um, anything north of 10% is a really good number, albeit in the last couple uh, years, we've seen that margin come down, but we really are returning to a more normalized um, trend in what the profit margin is on these businesses. And uh, interesting to note too, um, the companies all, you know, are continuing to issue more uh, guidance moving forward. Uh, that is more on the upbeat side. Last year, there was so much uncertainty that correlated to the drop in the market because no one really knew what was going on as it relates to the Fed response to inflation and all the other factors going on. Today, we have a lot more clarity on what that roadmap is. Um, and today, we're much closer to a peak in interest rates. Uh, than we are last year, uh, which transitions well to our next topic, uh, interest rates, which have been on the top of everyone's mind uh, in a big way. And why don't we just take a, a second to step back and reflect that we go back to the beginning of 2022, interest rates were near zero and the market was expecting the year to end at about one and a half percent. I think we all know that that's not what happened. Uh, things moved in a much quicker way than anyone expected. And I think businesses had to respond and felt a lot of that pressure uh, as it comes to how they were able to invest their capital or where their borrowing costs would come from. And so if you look here today, uh, three month treasury rate is a great rate. Um, three month treasuries, one month treasuries are right around 5% one month treasuries have come down a little bit recently in the last month. But that short end of the curve is a lot of what you see on maybe money market rates. And, you know, it's an attractive place to be. We haven't been here in a long time. We actually could make some money um, on a money market position. Uh, but as we go out and the closer you get to five to 10 year, we're in more of a three 
in a half hum, three and three quarter percent range. So as long as you go out is really the market expectation for where the future economy is going to be. And what we see is these rates uh, on the five to 10 year range, not going to move a whole lot. Uh, the three to two year range we see over the next 12 months really was where you're going to see a lot of uh, downward pressure as the Fed uh, is going to, you know, be more likely to be cutting rates in the future. The short end of that curve will come down and be more normalized. Right now, as you can see, the shorter term is paying a higher rate and longer term is paying a lower rate. Uh, and that is commonly called an inverted yield curve, uh, which is not a normal thing for the economy. Okay? You would think the longer you, you know, invest your money, the more you'd want to be compensated, um, which is true in, in the world of investing. Uh, but right now, there's so much uncertainty uh, in the economy and the market over the longer period of time, um, where the Fed having the rate at 5% is elevating the short end of that curve, um, which will come down or more likely to come down as we move forward. And so really have two more slides here that I want to finish up on as to, you know, what do we do? There's so much uh, going on in the economy. There's so much pressure on uh, the economy is slowing down or growth slowing down. And it creates a lot of questions. And what we really see is always reflecting back on history. Um, why we invest, uh, you know, we're gonna invest in cash, fixed income, uh, equities, um, sometimes real estate, and uh, why we always believe in the market for our long-term dollars or long-term investing largely comes down to owning good businesses and the value of dividends. If we look at history, dividends have contributed to your total return. So if you look at the market every day, you look at, uh, let's say the S&P 500 that we're looking at here, you know, it's moving every day. Uh, and that is your price return. The movement day to day, uh, year over year is your price return. But healthy companies uh, who have steady cash flow also return dividends to shareholders um, and that contributes to part of the return. And throughout history, dividends have contributed to 40% of the total return number, which is huge. If we look here, uh, the darker blue is the dividend return number and dividends are always positive. You can't have a negative dividend where the market or the price appreciation is going to fluctuate. Some years it's, it's up significantly, uh, and some years it's down. Um, but I also want to correlate this over with inflation. Inflation obviously decreases the purchasing power or buying power of your dollars and has a real effect. And uh, I'm going to jump here to the next slide to illustrate uh, two last points. One, if we look here, we have the S&P in the black line, the Dow Jones in the green line, and then we have inflation. And so what this is showing is if I had invested, and this is looking at the last 10 years of the S&P or the Dow Jones, and I had bought essentially one share of each of those, so one share of the inflation, one share of uh, S&P 500, Dow Jones, um, what is the value of those dividends by just holding on today uh, versus where we started 10 years ago. So if I bought 10 years ago, I can see the value of my dividends went from a dollar, uh, and now it pays me $2.14 by just holding on to inflation, uh, or holding on to the S&P 500. Whereas compared to inflation, that purchasing power went from one to a dollar 27. And as you can see, in a big way, by holding on the price appreciation of dividends, the dividends being declared or paid out to shareholders has increased way more than what inflation has deteriorated in that purchasing power. The last point here also included what is the CP Alliance sample average. So this is looking at the individual stocks we buy today in portfolios and also compared this to inflation in Dow Jones and the S&P 500. I really wanna point out the point here, the large difference is while we're invested in the market, uh, our large portfolios generally will invest in individual stocks. And so why we do that is because we want to invest in the best of the best companies. Why? Well, right here is a good case in point as to why, because we can go buy good companies with a steady cash flow, with a long track record of paying dividends, 
And guess what? It worked. Uh, holding on and buying good companies uh, with good balance sheets over a long period of time uh, will, one, be more valuable than holding on to a broad index that has some good companies, some okay companies, but it also has some bad companies. And so we'd rather select and buy those individual stocks uh, of companies that we know they have good balance sheets, uh, they have good management in place, and will continue to outperform the broad market as it comes to just the fundamental analysis on those businesses. And I'm gonna end it there on my slides and I'll pass it back over to Marshall. Casey, thank you very much as always. Uh, appreciate you bringing us up to speed a little bit on <laughs> Casey's real job. Uh, every, in addition to being on the trading desk, uh, every Wednesday morning, he gets to uh, meet with us and uh, go through with the group of CPAs called the CPA Alliance and go through a similar presentation. If you can imagine doing that every single Wednesday, that's uh, quite a task. And he always does a fabulous job of bringing us up to speed and uh, making us better advisors and that's really really key for us and casey i just appreciate you so much and thanks for being with us and helping us out today so let's take a look now at the general economic conditions these change every quarter uh, of course uh, touching base on some of these things we'll go into further depth in just a minute but of course inflation is the the key on everyone's mind high but trending downward which is a good sign we got political tensions, which are heating up. Uh, we've had, uh, and since the last quarter's update, we've had several individuals announce that they are going to run for the office of president. We'll talk more about that. Geopolitical tensions, while you may not see as much in the press on, uh, on, on the war in Ukraine, um, it, it's still there, it's still going on. So uh, while the media may not give it as much attention as they did uh, back gosh, hard to say this, a year ago, um, it's still still ticking. Uh, interest rates, uh, they're historically still relatively low. I mean, you can still get first mortgages at great rates uh, from a historical perspective, but they aren't what they were. They're moving up. Uh, unemployment, still historically low. Demand is still high, but we're seeing a little bit of waning. And is there a banking crisis? So those are the things I'm gonna touch base on this morning. So let's look at GDP. As Casey alluded to, the first quarter GDP was up 1.1, but uh, at heading to that 0.4% uh, for the year, that tells us that things are going to have to slow down. And that's the intent of the Feds, to, is to slow things down gradually. We'll talk about that a little bit in a minute. But the key is that we are seeing progress in the goals that the Feds have set. So that brings up the question, is there a recession, a recession in your future? I'm gonna go on the hook and say, absolutely. There will always be a recession. There will always be growth. That's just part of the normal economic cycle. But let's talk about what a recession is. Two consecutive quarters of negative GDP. Well, we haven't had one yet, but to get from 1.1 to 0.4, obviously there's gotta be the slowdown. It's when the National Bureau of Economic Research actually says it's a, re it's, it's a recession. Uh, kind of like I remember with my parents. Uh, when they said it was something, it was something. And of course, the biggest thing to remember is it's not 2008. So many people equate recession with 2008. Those are two totally different things. You can look at the economic charts for decades and you can see where there were recessions but nothing like many of us have experienced and lived through uh, 2008, different ball game. So what is inflation? Well, we've dropped down from that 7% in 2021, uh, 6.5 in 2022, Q1 is 5.2. So things are going in the right direction. I feel a little bad even slowing this, showing this slide uh, because obviously if you've ever been in, in a, a gas station still or Publix or any grocery store, you know that things aren't what they were a few years ago. And I always look at these numbers and go, gosh, it just doesn't feel in my wallet that that's the number. It always feels like, wow, reality is higher. 
The next thing we have is the picture of our wonderful Chairman Powell, who says we are headed for a soft landing. Uh, of course, we have this, the skeptical economists who still don't believe they can pull it off. But of course, I'm the eternal optimist, and I always believe let's give them the benefit of the doubt and hope that they pull it off. Is this a soft landing? Uh, this is the trend, of course, for inflation that we are, uh, or the feds are trying to gear to, trying to work for. And I have to admit, I'm a trend guy. I look at this and I see a trend. I first got introduced to trends back when my mother would call my name. And you may remember this, you would hear your name called and then in a minute, your middle name would get inserted to when she was calling you. You knew that was a trend and it was time to, to react to it. Well, this is a trend. So we see that, is it going to be a soft landing? But if, uh, unfortunately, the pilot in me comes out as well. And if this is my glide slope coming into land, it's not all bad. There's a few little bumps in it for the winds, the headwinds that are affecting the economy, uh, the headwinds that might have impact your airplane and your landing, but overall, looks like it might be a smooth landing and we're going to hope for the best. That soft landing by definition of the Fed uh, is very specific in, in, in many ways. What they want is that the Fed funds rates would get up to that 4.5 range. We're in that range. Unemployment would remain less than 5%. Well, it's still less than 5. Inflation less than 3. Well, we got a got a ways to go to get there. Uh, but it's getting closer and positive GDP, not a recession. Now, Chairman Powell says there will be positive growth over the full year, even if 0.4 isn't much, it's still positive. Uh, I'm not sure what negative growth is, that kind of is an oxymoron to me, but we're going to go with positive growth. There's an increased forecasting of a slight recession that has been moved from Q2 or Q3 in 2023 to Q4. So it looks like there's enough momentum that will carry uh, pos continued positive growth uh, in Q3, maybe, or excuse me, Q2, maybe into Q3, but the consensus generally is that by Q4, we may see a slight recession, which just means you don't have growth. Um, it's anticipated that the Fed will raise rates another 25 basis points next Wednesday and maybe another 25 in subsequent quarters to push the Fed funds rate above five. All I can say is stay tuned. We don't know exactly when they're gonna do things, but it, this is what the general thinking is in the current horizon. Well, political tensions. How can you turn on the TV or pick up a newspaper or go online and not see some of these? Um, the US debt continues to run rampant and unchecked. Uh, that's just, it's just crazy. Um, the uh, Speaker of the House, Mr. McCarthy, uh, faced a big test this week with a vote on the Republican controlled House bill to raise the debt ceiling. Uh, this includes an estimated 4.5 trillion in spending cuts that Democrats vehemently oppose. Uh, basically, once this bill that got passed uh, hits the Democratic controlled Senate, it's dead. Uh, so it, it was a nice gesture by the House, but the reality is uh, we got a long way to go. Both sides have been and continue to just dig their heels in uh, on the debt ceiling. Uh, we've, given, we've been given a new term. This is kind of cool. We now have the X date. Uh, the U.S. Treasury is inching towards the X date, uh, which is when the federal government runs out of money. What an interesting concept to talk about. Uh, but anyway, we're hopefully that there will be negotiations and conversation. There's a bill that got passed. So now is the time that hopefully we'll see some statesmanship and compromise. Uh, we all know that there seems to be a shortage of that in Congress, but we're going to all, again, optimistic, going to hope for the best. Uh, the estimates of the default deadline have varied widely because of the, the date hinges on tax collections. Uh, the Treasury began employing some extraordinary measures earlier this year and said it wouldn't run out of cash before June. Uh, the new data kind of narrowed that estimate, uh, probably warning of a potential default as soon as June or signaling that lawmakers and the White House have some breathing room before they have to actually do the 11th hour negotiation. 
Keep in mind, the next estimated tax payment date is June 15th. Well, that's payday uh, for the federal government. So the battle of words will wage until then, and, but remember, it's policy, not politics, that drive the economy. So some spending cuts would be good always. We know that the federal budget's bloated in so many different areas. That would be a positive thing, but obviously we got to get spending under control. Hopefully this isn't another Gingrich versus Clinton back in 1995 or Cruz versus Obama in 2013. So that's our challenges on the U.S. debt. Donald Trump, a past president and leading Republican candidate in the 2024 presidential race, has been indicted on felony charges. Wow, that's a new first. I'll, at least, I'll just drop that one right there. And we have now a presidential candidate who would turn 86 before his term ends because Biden wants to remain in office. Interesting political challenges and political tensions, and I'm not gonna opine on the last two. I know you're surprised at that. Geopolitical tensions. Well, Russia versus Ukraine versus Europe versus the US taxpayer. Uh, this has become even more prevalent. The dollars continue to mount billions of dollars going into the, battling that war. Russia and China versus who? We see a closer relationship all the time as China continues to support Russia. And in the meantime, China tends to continue to threaten Taiwan. So overall, Europe is in worse shape than the US. They're trying to figure that out. I had the pleasure of uh, a lengthy uh, virtual meeting with a new client in Germany earlier this week and she was expressing many of the things. She has her doctoral in business. And uh, it was very interesting talking to her about the European economy. Look forward to continuing those conversations. North Korea, uh, talk about loose cannons. Uh, that's a perpetual question mark. And is the target of the aggression or potential aggression South Korea or Japan? We don't know. So interesting things on the geopolitical side to continue to monitor uh, but nothing seems to be at a severe boiling point at the moment. Interest rates, 10-year treasuries, we saw earlier about 3.5, which equates to a 30-year mortgage of about 7%. Generally, the point spread between the 10-year mortgage and the 30-year, excuse me, the 10-year treasury and the 30-year mortgage ranges between about three to three and a half points to add on for the risk factor. Uh, what we have seen is that the near record high prices in the U.S. have made it more difficult for first time home buyers to compete. Uh, interest rates have more than doubled since 2021. And according to my realtor clients, the biggest hurdle is still supply. Uh, with the higher rates, people are a little more hesitant to sell because then they have to replace it and they would have to replace it with a higher interest rate mortgage. The bidding wars appear to have subsided and inventory is increasing slightly, but still not where it has been historically. Demand for mortgages fallen dramatically. The pace of increases is cooled off as rates scare off uh, buyers and builders alike. Mortgage refinancing is virtually uh, non-existent at this point. Rental demand is beginning to dry up a little bit too, as high prices are pushing more people to double up or move in with relatives. We'll see how that goes in the coming quarters. The help wanted, of course, we're staying pat at 3.5% uh, for our unemployment rates, uh, down from, from 2001, but holding steady. And there's a long way between 3.5 and 5.0 that the feds are leaning towards. So there's definitely room for a little bit of loosening in the unemployment without having a drastic impact on the economy. We're seeing the job postings, and this is from Indeed. Uh, we're seeing that the postings continue to decline uh, from a year earlier. Uh, so uh, we, we hear the press or see the press on what's happening in the tech industry and the banking industry, and even in, the, in McDonald's uh, having uh, large cuts of employees. Uh, this is reflective of how many of these companies were we're, we're filling their pipelines with personnel and special projects. And now that the economy's tightened a little bit, you have to take a little harder look uh, at where you're spending those dollars and which special projects have the greatest promise. 
The real culprit, though, seems to be small business still. Uh, those companies that employ 250 uh, or fewer employees, under 250, are the ones who are looking for the most employees. We may see that ease as some of the larger corporations that are getting the press uh, continue to have the layoffs. We'll see how that goes. Consumer confidence still remains high, but it's drifting. Uh, U.S. consumers uh, aren't feeling great about the economy, but they have a very curious way of showing it. Pessimism about the economy has been on the rise due, of course, to surging inflation, a little bit falling household income because of the inflation. And, of course, it was nice when we had that pandemic-related stimulus money coming in. Despite inflation's negative impact on purchasing power, uh, the consumer spending growth continues to be remarkably resilient. So why is this happening? It's simple. Consumers still have money, but that nest egg is declining. These savings are rapidly declining amid the high inflation. Uh, the rate of round of bank earnings shows that apprehensive hasn't kept Americans from reaching for their credit cards. Uh, consumer debt continues to be back on the rise again. Leading economic indicators imply a cautious recovery. This too has declined a little bit as we watch from 2021 to 22, but it isn't a horrible drop. Uh, things have dropped about 10% from 2021, but still, it's far from a crash of any type. Ordinarily, too, that would be something we'd be worried about, but again, it's part of the soft landing theory. Is there a banking crisis? Well, you're absolutely right if you think that <laughs> Having two of the world's largest banks fail in what it feels like a matter of days is a crisis. Uh, that happened. Um, is it industry-wide? We don't think so. But let's, let's drill down on that for a little bit. I doubt that there's anybody on here this call today who may have been a customer of uh, Silicon Valley Bank. But what happened over several years, the leadership at SVB rationalized a major decision to focus on a very narrow client base consisting almost entirely of tech entrepreneurs. As the tech industry boomed during the COVID years, it took in billions of dollars in deposit, which it dutifully parked over in seemingly safe U.S. treasuries. They got frustrated with the near zero interest rates uh, and the short end of the yield curve, as we saw earlier from Casey. So they began investing in long-term bonds in hopes of earning a few extra basis points on the bank capital. But then the Fed comes along and unleashes the steepest interest rate hike campaign in history, and the tech companies uh, suddenly found themselves struggling to raise capital. And the value of the long-term bonds, of course, with interest rates going up, bond values came down. So as their depositors were compelled to withdraw their cash reserves to fund the business growth, the Silicon Valley Bank was forced to liquidate its bond holdings at a huge loss. The result, a death spiral that ultimately triggered the bank's collapse. Well, it's not the banking industry. It's a very, very narrow type of banking that caused this issue. So uh, interestingly enough, one of the people I enjoy listening to and respect very much, Warren Buffett, in a recent interview stated that he would bet $1 million no one would lose a dollar in U.S. banks in the next year. I think that's a reliable source, and he's probably right. Unrelated, there were congressional proposals immediately surfacing designed to guarantee 100% of deposits in U.S. bank and ignore the FDIC limits. Not a reliable source. And I'd want to put this under the heading of, you might want to think that one through. Investing in uncertain times. Well, I have this phrase I always have to throw out, and that is, when was the last time times were certain? Uh, when I look at this slide of there's always a reason not to buy stocks, and we show this just to reflect, we go back to 2016 with our as we were coming into our annual economic update in the early part of 2017, and I look at these crises uh, that have faced us from an investing standpoint. Uh, <laughs> we don't know exactly what all the reasons will be for year 2023, but uh, at the rate it's going, I might need a whole slide just dedicated to 2023 for reasons not to buy stock. 
But the reality is when you look, the S&P 500 50 year <laughs> average return is still 11.8%. And that's taking into account a horrible year last year. So who knows uh, where we'll end up, but as Casey showed us uh, the performance for Q1 uh, was pretty good. So we'll see what happens as we go through the coming months. Let's look at those historical market fluctuations and you can see, well, we're getting that trend of the slowdown sideways. And these numbers are actually through Tuesday. And as you can see, the market continues on that upward trend. We're getting a little sideways activity. Or are we ready to come out uh, of that decline that we showed uh, back running in 2002 that kind of broke last September? Uh, since then, we've seen some increase in the market. And I think we're still going to head in that direction. So where should I invest now? Casey gave a chart earlier that talked about increase in price, increase from inflation, and increase from dividends. And every economic update, I always talk about looking for solid companies with strong dividends and a strong track record. So this chart, I'll walk you through it. You look at the dividend growers and initiators. These are those large companies who have a long-term history. And this goes back to 1978, a history of paying their dividend and increasing their dividend. So a company like that, you look to and you go, okay, the return during that period was 13.2%. Their standard deviation was 15.3%. That's your price fluctuation uh, on that particular type of holding. Then you look at the S&P 500 index. Now we've got not just the high dividend growers on the left column, we've got the S&P 500. We've got 500 companies. Well, by definition, if you have an index uh, and you've got 500 companies, you've got 250 winners and 250 losers. The goal of the first box, of course, is to have the try and pick the winners over on the first group and you ended up with a little higher standard deviation now we go to the non-dividend payers return hasn't been great and the volatility the standard deviation is higher and you look at those who cut their dividend or eliminate their dividend well there's probably a pretty good sign that there's trouble on board so again in looking at where should you invest your money solid companies that pay solid dividends. And when you're investing in companies, buy companies, not headlines. Keep in mind, we're constantly besieged by worries about government deficits, debt ceilings, Federal Reserve policies, inflation, oil prices, in short, the irrational world we live in. Yet publicly owned companies, which we patronize, sometimes daily, continue to prosper, growing their earnings, increasing their dividends. These have always been the eventual safe haven for investing for the long term. It's the objective of mainstream media to foster a culture of clickbait catastrophes. We didn't have clickbait 25 years ago. This is to develop an illusion that our existence as we know it is coming to an abrupt halt. The U.S. economy is inherently fragile, unstable, and the equity market may at any moment be subject to savage, long-lasting decline. Hasn't happened. Got a lot of reasons why it's supposed to have happened on that prior chart, but it hasn't happened. Yet we know it is impossible to succeed as long-term equity investors without some fundamental level of face in the future. <laughs> Details at 11. So what should you be doing with your financial plan? Very simple. You should be taking care of the things you can control. As I harp all the time, make sure your four documents are in place. Make sure that you've looked at your portfolio and the companies you're holding are aligned with your anticipation and your advisor's anticipation of what the economy is up to in the coming years. Those are the important things that you need to look at. So KC, I'm gonna ask you to field a couple of questions if you would. First question for you, KC, in the current interest rate environment, where should I park cash? All right, Marshall, that's a great question. A question that's been a hot topic, especially really over the last six, 12 months. Uh, and the reason being is because finally cash 
uh, like we talked about earlier, if there is some compensation. And so, you know, you really have a couple options. You know, your cash money is needs to be safe. You don't want the value of that dollar uh, to be at risk. Uh, the only risk cash really has is what inflation will be. And like we talked about earlier, inflation moving forward certainly won't be the inflation we've had moving backwards. And so what we want to do for as much as we can try to keep uh, cash uh, not to lose as much as possible to inflation. You know, as we see earlier, we literally last 10 years, um, you know, inflation is going to deteriorate the value of your dollar. Uh, but today, three options is really treasury, CDs and money markets. Now, all of them are really pretty similar. Uh, money markets are going to be much shorter. They're going to stay in that treasury range of really um, overnight to, to out to a month. Uh, and those rates really are around four, four and a half percent. And that's a great place to be. And that's really my first recommendation uh, because that cash is liquid. You need it tomorrow, it's there. You need it in a month, it's there. Uh, treasuries and CDs may come into play but there is risk. You don't want to put any of that money where you may need it in the near term. Generally, it's going to be six to 12 months out on those to make it worthwhile where money markets today, you know, really, I would say anywhere from zero to 12 months of cash needs. Money market is a great place. Uh, you know, we test custody with Fidelity, uh, but many, many platforms have money markets that are much more attractive today. And that dollar is always there. You need it to write checks, to withdraw again, um, and really provide a great option. That's great, Casey. Let me, I got kind of a follow-up question. Uh, if you'll reach over to your shelf and grab your crystal ball, uh, where will interest rates be in 12 months? And should I change my investments to chase that? <laughs> That's a great question. I always reflect back, like we talked about earlier, a year ago in the beginning of 2022, where we thought we would go uh, to where we went. And even we reflect the beginning of this year, beginning of this year, everyone was thinking we'd be north of 6%, but then the banking uh, collapse and issues begin to happen and that drastically changed the roadmap for inflation or uh, interest rates. So at the end of the day, we don't know, but if I were to guess 12 months from today, interest rates are gonna be lower. And so what that means is kind of like the cash conversation is you don't wanna get too stuck on today's rates because today's rates a money market or CDs or whatever aren't going to be uh, the same rates of the future. And so really what we're seeing and, and beginning to make a move is on really, you know, we still need safety. There's still uncertainty. So I'm not going to go out and, and put a bunch in high yield bonds. But, you know, if we have long term money, equities is still the best place to be uh, for that mid term or kind of mid range of dollars. Maybe what you need for the next three to five years is really that allocation you're going to put towards fixed income. And I think we're at a point now where we've been much short to kind of keep safety in the portfolio. Now there's beginning to be more states and rewards uh, going out. If you think of a bond, you know, really that five year range, five to seven year range on a bond. And, and that's really where some changes may on our philosophy uh, may begin to make some moves, but where your opportunity is because what's going to happen is future rates are going to be lower. So today you can go out and buy a four or 5% on investment grade bonds where in 12 months today from today those rates may be at three and a half percent and so today is kind of like you know if you buying mortgage rate at a low rate um it's awesome where if you're investing your money giving your money uh loaning it you want to be paid a higher compensation and today is a higher compensation and a great time to make that move um, but certainly your buckets and how much you have in each of those cash bump bonds and equities is a very important to take a look at and review right now. Thanks, Casey. As usual, great advice. I uh, don't see any final questions from the audience. Our next scheduled quarterly economic update, second quarter, will be Thursday, July 27th, uh, 2023 at 10 a.m. I'm certain it will be interesting. So thank you for joining us. We look forward to meeting with you soon. Take care.